Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another V Brown Bag. Uh, with us tonight is Ariel Sanchez Mora presenting on Ansible and vSphere from zero to useful. Just a couple quick housekeeping notes before we get started tonight. We have multiple shows you can watch throughout the week. And also make sure you get in on the conversation. You can tweet us at V Brown Bag or using the hashtag, hashtag V Brown Bag or get involved uh, on the uh, comments here on the GoToWebinar if you're watching live. I am your host, Ken Nalbone. And once again, uh, we are joined tonight by Ariel Sanchez. Ariel, I'm going to switch it over to you now, make you presenter, and you can take it away. Thank you so much, Ken. As soon as I find your name at the presenters list. <laughs> Oh, there's two of us organizers in here tonight. Just take it. Yeah, I'll change myself. <laughs> there you go. Right. Very, very cool. All right, so I'm going to go in presenter mode here. First of all, thank you so much, everybody that that's attending live. I, I see a lot of friends there, even some some people that know Ansible better than me. So we're going to try to get them into the presentation. Uh, tonight, I, I saw Chris Arsenault, who is with us in the, in, in the the audience tonight. I saw his presentation and I really liked it. But this session today is like, if you were looking at that session or, or if you've heard of Ansible and you're like, I have no idea how to get started with this. This is the session where you go like, I know nothing about Ansible. And I hear it can be used to interface with vSphere. So this is really for, for the, the vSphere administrator that has never done anything with Ansible. All right, so you will find this presentation and the source code in my blog, uh, or just ping me on Twitter. Twitter is our thing. This is how we how we move. So, uh, I there's a, a big shout out to my friend Ken, uh, who just switched jobs, and he's going to be doing some really cool stuff. Ken, I, I really want you to take like a minute and and tell everybody in the in the recording. Sure. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, <laughs> you know, I crave the spotlight. So yes, I am joining Gestalt IT. I will be a uh, event lead for the Tech Field Day uh, event series starting on October 22nd. You'll see me uh, in the background on a couple of events, but I will be the guy for Cloud Field Day uh, 5 coming up in April of 2019. Very, very, very cool. Thank you. I wish you all the best and uh, great hire by Stephen Foskett and the team. All right. So the agenda today, we're going to talk a little, a little bit about me. We're going to talk about the Zero to Useful series, uh, what's Ansible and why do I care, setting up Ansible for the first time on a Linux server, uh, two ways of talking to vSphere, uh, playbooks, which is when we actually get to do the thing. Uh, we have a vCenter and a, a vCSA that I'm bringing up right now. And uh, we'll be able to play some of it. And hopefully, we'll get to play, uh, to have some interaction with people that know more about me, more about Ansible than I do. And we'll have some value discussion and further reading. Okay. Uh, send out a tweet. So this is obviously in Spanish, but if you can send out a tweet with a hashtag bbrownbag or hashtag F02U, um, I would really appreciate it. Just, just to know that you liked it. Let me know your feedback. I'm always looking to improve. So. That accent that you're hearing is a Costa Rican talking to you. I live in Pittsburgh right now. I was a customer for a long time, but just in the last year and a half, I started working for VMware as a technical account manager. I very much love the big community, not just V Brown, but I'm part of the crew and it's fun to be a, the presenter instead of the host. Uh, I haven't done this in a long while. Uh, the expert, in fact, today VXpert Pro was announced, which is pretty cool. And we'll have some separate blog posts about that. Uh, I love VMUG, VTUG, uh, BV or B Brisket, whatever starts with a B. I think we even have a V Street Fighter if you want to play Street Fighter V with us. Uh, I use Twitter as a work tool and I encourage everybody to do the same. And I always want to help anyone that hasn't ever presented a VMUG to present. So let me know if I can help you, okay? The Zero to Useful series, we started this in the Brown Bag, uh, actually with VRLI Ops with uh, Tom Green. It's a teach me like I'm a noob, you know what? This is, this is really how a lot of administrators out there, this is how they learn. 
they sit down with a with their senior admin and they go through something for an hour and especially it has to be a practical session you know there are no dumb questions we're going to be basically trying to go from what someone else has learned and trying to transfer that knowledge to someone else so that's our hashtag we've done a virilize ops we've done a i think we've done a, v, a vro with your glue and this will be our our span our, our, our english version of the ansible mb sphere so third in the series that's pretty cool again interactive session we will do we're going to do practical things uh, the 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 slideshow should be short enough. Uh, we're going to be doing this on a CentOS VM running Ansible. Right, let's go real quick so you can see that. So you can see here, this is my, um, my workstation where I've started a host. And I'm also going to bring this uh, CentOS VM. I'm going to power it on a little bit. We're going to log into it. So that CentOS VM. We're going to go into a little more detail on how it's set up. Uh, you can follow me along. And again, this is an intro series. I'm no expert. We have a lot of people here that are really good at this. So if you have questions, if you have anything that I can't answer, I'm pretty sure someone else in the audience will be able to answer. All right. So what's Ansible and why do I care? So Ansible is open source software. Uh, it's true that it was bought by Red Hat, but that's for the commercial side of if you want support and enterprise features. It is very, very flexible. Um, it doesn't require any agent to deploy. So that separates it from other solutions such as Puppet and Chef. Um, you can do one-time changes with it, just like you would do with Power CLI, but it also allows you to really run infrastructure as code. So you can run this on a schedule. You can run this through some other uh, methods that allow you to say, this is really what the code that I see is the infrastructure that is running out there. That's basically the concept behind, behind, uh, behind the infrastructure as code. And uh, it uses YAML, yet another markup language, which is very, very readable. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit. And I do mean flexible. It is an infrastructure. This is not a, just a tool to manage OS or servers or network equipment. It manages anything. It can interface with about anything that has an API, or even if it has to log in through SSH, it can do it. There's a lot of modules out there that uh, the community has come out and uh, basically given a way so that you can interface to whatever solution you have. There's lots of abstraction in these models. What you have to figure out is really the minimum input. Someone else has already figured out how to make the tool work. And one thing that I love about it, it, it really helps break down silos and allows networking and system management and dev dev developers to collaborate using the same tools, right? So if I had to explain Ansible in a nutshell to you, once you're set up, there's a command called Ansible Playbook, which executes a playbook. So what's a playbook? A playbook is just a YAML file, which is literally a text file. Uh, obviously, it has its own particular formatting. Uh, the playbook defines tasks. These tasks are the ones that leverage modules to change an inventory. That inventory can be like the Etsy hosts, right, in, in locally, or it can be gathered dynamically. Now, that's it. That's all it's doing. Now, researching modules is probably going to be your most time intensive task, apart from troubleshooting whenever something doesn't work as expected. But that's Ansible in a nutshell. So if I had to show you a diagram, right? I'll bring up my mouse here. So your users are creating a playbook. That playbook, you know, once you actually execute this, it looks at the inventory, uh, it gathers the modules that you're using. It, goes and talks to APIs, to plugins, and it goes out and changes changes uh, the host or the networking that you have. And I'm going to leave, there's a really nice YouTube video over here by Red Hat, where I got this image from that explains how Ansible works. So it's going to be a new tool in your tool set. And, and thanks to Larry Caposa, uh, 
the wife of Carl Caposa, who was the original person that interested me in Ansible and automation and with vSphere. And uh, I've seen several variations of this, but this one is so much fun. You know, we as vSphere admins have been hearing about the cloud and the CICD pipelines, and we've been hearing about all these new ways of doing things. So this is going to be something new that you learn. All right. So how do we set up Ansible? Now, if, if you have a Mac, for example, it's even easier than this. But I know that most VMware admins, they come from a Windows background. So even though you can also set up in Windows, what I decided to do is just set it up on a Linux server, um, just because it's super simple to do. Uh, I'm using CentOS. You can use any uh, Unix. Uh, I do recommend that you install using pip. Uh, you're going to see what I'm going to talk about in a little bit, just because it makes sure that Ansible, Python, and PYV Mummy are all in compatible versions. Uh, this way, it just works. Okay. So we have a Linux VM. It's a one CPU, one gig of RAM, has a static IP address, uh, minimal install. I set up a separate admin user, and it's just not using root, it's using ASM. Make sure you can reach the internet on it. Uh, you want to patch the OS, SSH through PuTTY, and literally that this, this command is just to update CentOS, but everything else that you see here, that's all the command you need. This command literally allows you to run easy install. Easy install allows you to run pip, and then you will tell pip, hey pip, install PYV mommy. Hey pip, install Ansible. That's it. There's nothing else that you need to do to run Ansible. Um, I don't have the instructions today for, for Windows, but installing pip and in Python in Windows is not complex. And once you have pip running, you can just run these two commands. And I know that if you want to do it in Mac, you have to use Homebrew, but I'll leave those to the those exercises to the reader, I guess. All right, so your first Ansible command is gonna be uh, using the ping module to test ping in the local host. And you should get Pong back. So if you do an Ansible minus M ping and the local host IP address, you should be able to see this back. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to find my putty. And I'm going to go to my Ansible VM. Let me make sure this may, I make this bigger. Appearance, this font. Let's make this what a 22, maybe 26. How does that look on your on your screen, Pan, over there? Plenty big now. Cool. I got that right. Maybe not. Let's try VMware one bang. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to do ping minus. So Ansible minus ping, module ping, 127.0.0.1. All right, so if you get colored fonts, you're probably doing it right. And you can see that Ansible was able to run, and the ping module was able to tell me, hey, ping pong, that sports out there. Cool. So another thing, you'll be surprised when, we, when VMware releases, like for example, 6.7 or 6.7 update one, one of the things that drops at the same time is the SDK. So you can always count on the SDK to be released at the same time that we release the product. So in this case, I'm just gonna show PYV mommy and you can see here that it's running on version 6.7, which is the same version that my host is running. Whenever 6.7 update one comes out, there may be an update to this. And you can tell where you can find more information about this right here, right? Cool. So if you're trying to connect to a 6.5, um, with a 6.5 SDK or PYV mommy version, and you're trying to connect to a 6.7 update one, you might need to update your stuff. So just be mindful of which SDK version you're running. 
especially with the REST, REST API, is going to matter. All right, so let's dive into two ways of talking to vSphere. So the traditional method uh, that Ansible.com will show you is uh, using modules that rely on that PYV mommy SDK. So you'll find this on the web page that says out of the box Ansible ships with over 20 VMware. It's actually more than 20. Let's go take a look. Make sure you guys can see this. Yeah, it should be right. So this is the Ansible documentation for VMware. And you can see that we have a lot of modules listed over here. More than 20, like people have been adding and adding. Uh, I want to just dive into one of these, let's say data center, because that's a really simple one. And what you'll see here is that you get the name of the module. This is what you would have to put in the YAML file. This is what it does. And it tells you this module can be used to manage the data centers. It requires your version. So again, this is why I was mentioning how to check your versions. And this is what it requires. It requires a data center name. And there's a lot of options. So you're, you're basically calling functions, right? So it has been tested. And here's some examples. So it's pretty cool. You can literally copy paste this code into a YAML file. And when you say state present, it will create it. When you say state absent, it will delete it. So we'll come back to this a little bit more, but you can even talk to the people that have created this module. Right. Let's go back to this. So that's the list of let's that, that's like the official way of the way that Ansible.com will tell you to talk to VMware. But there's also a very important uh, and more modern method uh, to talk to VMware, and that is through the vCenter REST API. And this is available since 6.5, and it has been improved in 6.7. So we're basically going to use only one module, module called the URI uh, to be able to talk to REST API. Now, th all this module does is it allows you to make HTTP, HTTP calls to your vCenter. So what are we talking about? We're going to make get, post, put, delete. Uh, what's the difference between a post and a put? A post sets up a new configuration. A put modifies an existing configuration. And you basically, in, in any HTML interaction, you want to see an OK 200. That means that everything went well. If you get a 500, that means that there was some kind of error. Um, and you don't need to know a lot about this. Uh, all you need is already installed with your VCSA appliance. There's a really cool way to explore it right there. So, I always like to say that REST is easy. Uh, Kyle Ruddy uh, did an excellent B Brown Bank video on how to play with the API Explorer. So if you go to your vCenter and do it dash API Explorer, or you click on where it says Browse vSphere REST APIs, you will be able to see um, the REST interface that we can get there. So I'm, I'm going to go right now to the vCenter that I have running on the host locally. So this is my local host. I just want to show you. I have a vCenter in here. That's, that's the only VM running right now. Bang. There we go. So that's my vCSA. The host is a uh, 6.7. The vCSA is 6.7. And uh, this is our host right here. So this is and see very well. This is where you see the REST APIs. If you click on that, all it does is adds API Explorer over here. And you get several options, right? So you can do, there are several ways. And if you want to talk to basically the, the VCSA itself, you can do appliance. But most of the things that we're concerned about is vCenter. So one thing that if you want to, go oh, sorry. Yeah, there was one question regarding, uh, you know, the API Explorer. Is it for VCSA only or Windows vCenter as well? Oh, yeah. I think we still support the, the Windows vCenter. You should get off that. Uh, the next version is not going to be available. Um, no, uh, seriously, I'm pretty sure it's available for the Windows vCenter as well. Uh, might not have the same appliance 
option down here. But if you just go to a vCenter and do it uh, backslash API Explorer, you'll find it. But seriously, if you're in 6.5, 6.7, you should be doing the VCSA. Um, we're, we're very, we give a lot of time to people to tell them, hey, you know, move along, get to something else. And I get that sometimes we have solutions that are kind of dependent on having Windows vCenter. But you should really be planning on, especially for the next release, whatever that's going to be, or whenever we go to 7.x, I would, I'm pretty sure that's not going to have a Windows component to it anymore. So there's your answer. API Explorer works with Windows vCenter, but you shouldn't be using it anyway. Yeah, basically. Yep, yep, yep. And then and I, th I see Andy. This is so good to be the presenter and be able to see the questions. I see Andy uh, sent out a very nice link. Thank you, Andy, about getting started with the, this here API Explorer. Let me see who the author was on this. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Kyle as well. Yeah, there's Kyle. Very, very cool. So what we're going to do right now is just a, li a little demo. Now, you have to be logged in before you do anything, right? And this is the same administrator at least here, the local. I don't have anything crazy here. I have everything in VMware one bang, just so I don't forget it. Whatever. Administrator at local. Cool. So we were looking at the data center option before. And let's go ahead and take a look at the data center option now. And this is just a very good example to start. If we do a get, we will get the information of at most a thousand virtual data centers. And of course, most people don't have a thousand virtual data centers. But if you are successful, status 200, you should get name and data center. Right? Uh, here's some parameters that you can use. But the cool part is if you do if you do try it out. So if you do try it out, basically what happens. is it will call out to the to the same vCenter IP or you know the vCenter URL it will go ahead and say hey I'm making a rest call in your vCenter can you look can you list me your data centers and this is the response body right this is the what the web server is replying back to you it's saying hey uh, yeah I got a data center I internally I call it data center dash two uh, the tag of it is VDC LTP. And if we go and take a look at that, you'll see that it matches is perfect. It matches exactly that. That's the name of my uh, V data center there. As you can tell they are different logins. Uh, the because you're logged into the client doesn't mean you're logged into the API uh, Explorer. While you're waiting on that to load, we just have one other comment saying, in regards to the Windows question, most of the Ansible modules still use the SOAP SDK through Pi, Pi v Momi. So mm -hmm. very few modules have moved over to the REST API and a lot of the functionality doesn't exist. Just an FYI, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna talk a little about that. So basically whatever you see in the REST API today, anything you see in this interface, we are able to call it through the URI module. However, and this is very like, and let me see who, who, who said that. Um, Matthew Welch. Yes, that is correct. There's still a lot of things that are not available in the REST API. Um, so, Coming back to what we were talking about, you can see that indeed my data center is called VDC LTP. All right, so we are learning that we have another way to interact with vCenter, which is through the REST APIs with, with either gets that are normally requests for information, but we also have posts where we can tell it, hey, I want to, um, let's see, I haven't, I haven't done this ever, so let's try it out. Uh, let's just call you Ken Galbone, right? 
that request. Let's see why I missed it. So you can see that I did not get a 200. Uh, what am I missing? I might need something else here. Main. Create a new Viva Center. I might need to do this in this method. I might need to do value. And maybe that, that it will like that better. I still got a 400. I just can't. How about that? I still didn't like it. If I refresh here, it didn't create it. Hmm. So there's something to be checked in there. So if you scroll up a bit, I think somebody was saying maybe it needs to look a bit more like the example on the right hand side there, where under where it says example value on the right. Uh -huh. I like it. Interactive. Uh, can I copy paste this? Oh, let's just try it. Spec. Open that. Me. If this works, you can say thank you to Graham. And if it doesn't, you can blame Graham. <laughs> folder. I wonder what the folder should be. What was the folder before? See, the folder might be a a. a structure region. I'm just gonna deal with the spec. But I think you're completely right on the spec. It might be like a root folder or something like that. I think that's that could be what it is. Let's try that. Still didn't like it. I wonder what the folder is there. What if I just give you a name? Do you like it? How about an empty string? For, yeah, for the folder. That was the question. I heard the guitar. Guitar. I heard the guitar, someone moved and it sounded like a piano or a guitar. Uh, I think you heard my mug. Uh, 404. All right, so I definitely don't know how to create a, a data center. And you would have to search that out. But basically, this the, the idea is that you check that this interface allows you to play and have a different communication method with the center. Uh, perhaps if somebody can tell me what exactly to put in there. Let me go back to the presentation for now. All right. So again, I recommend Kyle Roddy's video. He did an excellent job there. And, and we also did something like this where it was like, hey, create a VM. And creating a VM is actually tougher than you would imagine because there's a lot of little steps that you have to do in order to create a VM. So we have some fun with that. All right. So rest changes every time we have a release. The whole idea is that REST will be, will reach feature parity with the old SDKs. But 6.5 was the first time that we released the REST API. 6.7 has more, but you still won't find everything. So if you go to William Lancelot, and he does a really good job every time we have a release of highlighting what the new REST APIs uh, have been made available. You know, not only so, but if you scroll down here, he has a, hey, we have a new REST API and, and we have all of these things that weren't there before. So I consider uh, William Lamb an alpha, meaning that he creates content that is nowhere, not available anywhere else. So always make sure to check his blog whenever a new release comes out. He will most likely have 
something that relates to the new REST APIs. Um, what do we need? We need more customers to be complaining. We need more customers to tell uh, pro project managers and product managers that we want to see that RESTful API be at feature parity, just like everybody else has done with the HTML5 client. So if you are a person that is using RESTful API methods today, I want you to be complaining of whatever you can't achieve and complaining loudly, either in the VMware Slack channels or through Twitter. Um, thank God we have some really responsive uh, PMs like um, um, Jake Robinson, for example, he's made, he's been made, he's made himself so available for others when he wants to hear this feedback. So make sure you, whenever you find something, you let someone know, especially your account teams, etc. All right, so enough of the playing around. Let's actually do something. Uh, we're going to see an example by Carl Caposa. Uh, he did a full Vima presentation, which is where I, I literally stole most of his presentation and adapted it into the format that you see today. Um, his original PowerPoint and files there. We, we recorded his session. We put it in the rebrand by channel. Uh, just remember, in open source, you're taking advantage, right? If someone else put the code there, that means that they're okay with you grabbing the code. Uh, these files are already in the centralized VM, so we can just play with it. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to open, I think I have an atom somewhere. And we're going to take a look at these files that I'm going to be playing with. These are already there, so if you look, we already have some some YAML files, this .yml files that we're going to be playing with. Let's close this up. So you see here, these are all the files that we're going to be playing with, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go um, Basically, Carl did a great job showcasing what this file is all about. So we, this is an example that showcases several ways of talking uh, to vSphere through Ansible. We're going to log in. We're going to get what hosts are available on this vCenter. We're going to set syslog on the host, and we're going to ensure that syslog is running. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do there are several ways to manage login credentials, uh, but especially if you're going to be sharing YAML files with other people, you don't want to put your credentials in that um, code that you're sharing. So the easiest way to manage uh, credentials separately is just to have it in a different file. Uh, I just want to make sure, Ken, I got a pop-up saying that my internet performance wasn't good. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Perfect. Okay. That scared me a little bit. So in this method, we're putting our credentials separately. And what we're doing in, in this little task, we're calling with this include variables uh, command here. We're telling them, go find this file. And we're going to put them in a variable called um, main. So that separate secrets.yml file. Is going to have a username, password, and host name. I'm just going to show it over here in Atom. So you can tell it's these three uh, hyphens indicated this is a YAML file. So they always have to be there. And one thing you'll learn about YAML files, they're very uh, strict on their formatting. Spaces matter in YAML files. So you can't really leave some spaces and think that things won't matter. Um, so you want to start your YAML file with three uh, hyphens, and then we're going to have this username, column, space, password, and the vCenter. And that was for my 6.5, but now I'm in 6.7, so it's going to be 40. All right, there's a whole other way of doing this um, with something called Vault. We're going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about it in a little while, but this example is going to be very, very simple. So I'm, I'm just trying for you not to have your, your credentials in the main playbook. All right, so now we're going to get into more fun. We're actually going to use that URI module to log in into the vCenter. 
So when you put in here URI, and then you notice that there's a couple spaces indentation here, this is telling Ansible, the name of the task is vCenter logging, and we're going to do, we're going to use a URI module to basically do a web call. And it's going to call, let me just check something here real quick. You see this secret over here? That's gonna be our variable name. So basically secret.username, secret.password, secret.hostname is how we're going to use those variables that we imported. So we're going to make a URL call to the host name, which is basically the vCenter. And this is the URL that you call to create that login session. And once that works with the username, password, with a post action, and if we get it to 100, we're going to register that token into login. Now that token, I'm gonna to go back here a little bit. Whenever you see that we had a successful interaction, this Heather VMware API session ID, this token is our authentication token. This is a way that we don't have to put a username and password each time we talk to vCenter. That's very useful when you're doing, dealing with RESTful API. So all of this is saying, we're gonna to try to log in, we're going to give it the username and password, and if it works, if we get status to go to 100, notice that I'm telling, don't worry about if the cert is valid or not, uh, go ahead and register that in login. Okay. So in theory, we have loaded our vCenter username and password, we have tried to log in, if it works, we have it now in a variable called login. All right, cool. Now we're going to take a look at another URI call. And remember what I was saying, uh, we did a REST API call that basically got the data centers, but now we're getting a list of the hosts. So that basically means that instead of data center, I am looking at the option for hosts. So if I do a get hosts, I should be able to get, oh, you have one host. It's 13 as connected and powered on, right? Which is what you see here in the, in the vCenter. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're basically doing that call and we're telling it, hey, use that login cookie to do that call. And with that, if that works okay, register that result as this variable called VC hosts. Uh, and basically, this VC host is literally this code that you see here, although in a JSON form. All right. So finally, now this is we've, we've shown two ways of creating a session with your uh, RESTful API, and we've shown a way to get some information out of the vCenter, just like we did with the UI. Now we're going to have to use uh, some different methods of actually doing something because this is something that we cannot do with the RESTful API. We're going to set the syslog host and we're going to ensure the syslog is running using the PYV mommy SDK instead of REST. So in here we have a name and this is where we tell it we're going to use a module, a module that is already baked, sorry, that is already baked into Ansible. Uh, if we go back to that list that we had of Ansible modules, we are actually going to use this module. Why? Because syslog in, oh, sorry, in ESXi is an advanced or it's an, it's a, an advanced option. So basically, this module allows us to manage adv advanced configurations in the SXI hosts. And there's a lot that you can use to it, but basically here you have some examples of code that you can do. Now notice we have some big differences. The first difference is each time you, do, you use a module, you have to use the host name, username, and password when you're calling it. But the cool part is a lot of us that have been working with vSphere, we're very familiar with um, strings like this, right? Because these are the strings that we use 
when we need to set up an advanced configuration on the host manually, we have to do it through VI or something things like that. So we're going to use this to set the option for the syslog global log host. And we're going to set it to an IP address. Again, validate search no. But we have this variable, VC host, which means that if I had one host, like I have in this example, or if I had 100 hosts, it'd be fine. It will iterate because of this with items man here, it would go ahead and do it through every host. All right? Let me make a pause. Let me see if there's any questions. No one else any questions right now. Is anybody sharing something cool? There are some um, links that you might be interested in. You might see them in the, there in the chat. Regarding, I think, you know, the, the um, issues we were having with the API Explorer earlier, though, specifically. Okay. Well, let's take a look. Let's see if we can get that fixed right now. What are they saying? Um, so Graham says he got the same errors. That's fine. I'm not too worried about that one. But thank you, Graham, for checking. All right. So that means that we have set syslog, but we know that syslog is, you know, it's, it's one setting. It needs more things. So we need to make sure that syslog is running. That will be our last part of our playbook. Uh, we're going to use the, the module called VMR Host Service Manager. And all it's doing is we have, we give it a service name and we tell it, is it present? Present means running. If it wasn't, it will start and make it running. Okay, so this is why we call it declarative. Whatever you put in here, it will make sure it gets done. All right, so that's a very long way of explaining the code, but I think it's really useful to, to break down each little part. And uh, let's go actually and let's go ahead and do it. So when this, re this runs, every task should give us green and tell us okay and then in the end we're going to get a little report so let's go back to our party session and we're going to run ansible playbook and i think i have called these of the auth gather hosts and uh, i'll just leave it at the base version here so again, Ansible playbook is the command that actually calls the playbook. And then you see that what you put in there as the name, bring it up here. What you put here as name is what shows up here. So gathering facts, secrets, logins, get host from vCenter, that comes from right here, okay? And if it was able to execute the command, you get those OKs. And finally, we get a little more when we actually try to do changes. So we can see that it did find host, host 9. Um, that was the, the IP address of the host that it found, just like we had seen when we did uh, a small call for the hosts. And then it tells you, hey, I'm trying to set the syslog. I'm trying to set the syslog service. Everything's fine. You know, with everything that you had done, that's exactly how it was. So we get the recap, the summary. And it tells you everything is exactly as you asked for. And I didn't have to change anything. And, and I was able to reach everything. Nothing failed. Um, so, you know, let's go ahead and do some changes, right? So that we can actually see some, some things going on. So just don't laugh at me because sometimes I get lost in VI, okay? Uh, we're going to go and let's say we change the syslog global host from 176 to I, 177, and then I'll do an escape, uh, right quit, and I think I, I didn't do sudo, so I need to do the right thing, okay? Seems, it seems it did it right. So I am going to run the same playbook again it has a slightly different syslog host, so I see, should see some changes. Ah, 
aha, it is no longer green, it is yellow. It is yellow because it found changes. So it's saying, I had to change something. So you get this little report over here that says, one of my tasks actually had to do something. So it's really cool. It's not really trying to do everything again. It knows if it actually had to change it from whatever it was, and it will only do those changes. So it's really efficient. And if you go back to the B center, and uh, click on the host and configure and all those things. I'm going to write it. So that's probably advanced system options. And let me move this. So these are, in, in case you're wondering, like, how do I find that setting? Well, there's an SDK documentation, right? But you can also just look at what the advanced system settings are on the web. So I think at some point I could actually put something here that says just show me says logs. All right, so I'm looking for setting called global host. Is it global then? I should know this. All right. not here. I have to think it's here. Oh, I know what I did wrong. It's not in the summary, but I have to do this. It's in the key. Okay. So you can tell that the host itself has had a, a change applied. All right. Simple enough. Does it, does it, has everything been clear up to now? Because the whole objective is that when you look at this, you go ahead and say, you know what, that, that didn't seem that complicated. If I just have to copy paste some code and do some changes, that's probably easy. We did have one question, Ariel. If you were to run this playbook yet again, would we now see zero changes since it's already run what you've changed? The power of the magic of having this run live is that we can see it for ourselves. So indeed, no changes now. Uh, it detected that the configuration was what we wanted, so it didn't do any changes. Cool, right? Very cool. Mm -hmm. This is this is why I love the 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 B Brown bag host has to be such a nice like yes presenter. It's very cool, but the whole point is that it's very very simple. So. You know, this is what I was saying. Okay, let's actually go do this and, you know, let's run this. But now I want to get into the value discussion, right? Because most advanced VMware administrators are going to be like, you know, I can do this with Power CLI uh, all day. And we all know that Power CLI really is the premier way of interfacing programmatically with your VMware environment. No question about it. It's just the best way to do it. There are several things that you can probably only get done with Power CLI today. However, what if the, you, you had never interfaced with an API? Could this, could Ansible be your first tool that helps you interface with APIs, right? And again, let's go back to what Ansible is. It's a very, very flexible tool that requires no setup uh, before you actually try to use it. So you could have a playbook that creates a VM and when that VM boots, boots, you could actually do OS management of that Windows or Linux OS with Ansible in the same playbook. Uh, I had a VBarback session with a gentleman out of New York called, uh, whose Twitter is Pete's underscore revenge, who did a very, very cool session on how he does a full Cisco data center using Ansible, where by the end, he just tells people, this is how you have to wire devices. But if they follow his instructions, the switches will go into self power on mode and they will get the configurations and they will all, everything will be configured. 
and he only had to spend some time in his laptop to get this done. Um, we have been playing with the open source versions, but you can get real support uh, from this if you go to Red Hat and tell them that you want to have the enterprise version Ansible. Um, and why do I mention that? Because if you notice, most of these Python modules that we have been talking about, well, all of them say uh, kind of this. They say that they are not guaranteed uh, to work, or this is a uh, this is really just a. Uh, uh, another one. I found that very a lot of these modules are like you know we provide this module, but there's no guarantees. Um, if it doesn't work, you know, go ahead and make a, a a PR to my repo and let's fix it, right? But. What if you're trying to run an enterprise on this? Well, here's another thing that you should know um, before I, go, I get there. If you want support in this kind of scenario, yes, you would go to Ansible and tell them, hey, I want your, your real version. But also, VMware only offers support for the API, whether it's the SDK for the SOAP API or, or the REST API. That's what VMware will support. If you call support, they will not tell you, hey, bring up your Ansible playable. Let's take a look at it. They will just look at what it's actually calling, and they will tell you, yeah, that's a supported API call. It should work this way. You know, And you can even buy SDK support, which, which will get you in a, in a separate queue. And especially if you're doing massive deployments, it's probably a good idea to have, because you will be able to deal with people that are supporting the API all the time. But so I just want to I just want to talk about it real clearly here. It's really really cool that you can do a lot of things um, with the open source modules. But if you hit a limit, you might need to pay. Okay. I think that's fair to say with everybody that's using CentOS in production. You kind of know, right? All right. So further reading, we have the official Ansible documentation. Uh, here are the three most important people that I would follow on Twitter and the GitHub for learning more about Ansible with these here. Uh, Jonathan Frappier, he's one of our friends. Uh, I don't know if he was able to attend to it. Let me take a look real quick. I told him to come over, but he told me that might not be possible. Um, Mr. Les Smith, which, who I think is here. Let me see if I can find you and uh, open up the mic. All right, Larry, can, can you actually hear us? Oops, I was on mute. How about now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Yeah, so I made sure people knew about your Twitter and uh, your GitHub because you have so many examples of, by the way, you still have this awesome beard. <laughs> it's longer than that, it looks much better. Oh, there you go. Larry has great, great, great examples in his many repositories. And I've even seen you like, whenever you couldn't do something with Ansible, you call PowerCLI with oh, yeah. Ansible script. So maybe take this little time and tell us about what, because you've been doing this longer than anybody else. Tell us yeah. about what your experience has been with, with Ansible and Beast here. Yeah, so it's across the board. Um, me and Jonathan, obviously, we went through quite a few of the iterations probably about two years ago when some of the vSphere modules didn't work real well. Um, they're still kind of hit and miss, if you will. Um, I think you looked at one of the projects. I know you and Carl were pinging me a while back. Um, there's a vSphere management, um, Ansible vSphere management. Mm-hmm. You take a look at that guy if you guys really want to see some ways of getting very creative with some stuff and Ariel, you did a great job on talking about being able to use power cli um obviously you can in, in this repository you can look and see how we can leverage ansible to actually create some templates that are just powershell commands um that you can actually call as part of your playbooks um and, and your roles and etc because what you'll find is that there, even though uh, Ansible does a really good job, there's there's advanced things that we might want to do. So for for example, 
Um, and Ariel, if I get talking too much, because I like to talk. No, please go ahead. <laughs> um, the, uh, what you'll find when you get into, so I do a lot of full stack deployments and things like that, meaning uh, you mentioned the thing about the Cisco. So massive data center, multi data center deployments um, from a roll on a rack in and standing up network gear and switches and routes and BGP and blah, 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 all the way down into containers and applications running. So eight to 10 hour run times um, from a pipeline. What you'll find is you, that there's going to be use cases as with any, any other tool that you wanna do something very creative or maybe you wanna add some logic um, that you can't get with Ansible. So you'll, you'll you do things, for example, PowerShell or Power CLI. You can use it to create templates and execute those PowerShell scripts um, to do advanced things. Um, in that project, you'll, you, you'll go into, if you ever get the chance, start exploring some of the templates um, that are there. Uh, Ariel, if you'll scroll up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what this, what this does is you start with one host that is a standalone host. If you go into the templates folder, you can see all the different templates that are available. Um, what it does is it takes a single host that has nothing on it other than an IP, and it completely builds it up, um, including deploying uh, v the VCSA at, from the OV, uh, OVF or OVA, mm -hmm. uh, deploying vCenter, as well as bringing other hosts into the mix and then it actually migrate VMs um, from the single host over to the cluster, and then it'll swing that other host back in, but then it'll also deploy um, Active Directory services that most of the stuff is based on Linux here, um, but you can still use it for whatever your use case is. Uh, so you see like vSphere, AD domain, things like that. Um, but it builds up a whole environment, sets up iSCSI, provisions all of your data stores, NFS or iSCSI, builds all of that, um, all of those constructs up. And then it stands up DDI scenarios where you have DHCP, IPAM, things like that, and deploys it. It has some flavors of Terraform in there, um, et cetera. So, yeah. And here's, here's something that I haven't dealt with at all, which is yep. Jinja 2 templates. Yeah, so man. That is yeah, like the second can, level, right? Yeah, I mean, it gets very creative. Uh, you can do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, one thing that this does that's very interesting is being able to use this tool. So when you build VMs, we all have been VM admins. Now, I claim ignorance on that because I haven't done a whole lot with vSphere other than um, playing with it here and there over the last probably three years. Um, but, you know, all the years that I did it, you know, it's absolutely still applicable. But one of the cool things that this does, um, being able to get into things, is, is enforcement. Um, Errol, you probably don't even know about that in this project, but what it does is when you build VMs, we've all been VM admins, we build VMs, maybe somebody goes in and renames a VM or mm -hmm. maybe, maybe moves it to a, um, a different DVS switch or some other vSwitch, whatever, and brings it up. Now, what, what I'm getting at from, a, from an enforcement perspective is, Errol, you did a great job talking about declarative. The whole idea is we want things to be declarative. We want it to be in the code. So what this, what you can do with this is from an enforcement perspective, when I build a VM, I record the UUID. That UUID will never change, right? Mm -hmm. So I collect that as, a, as an inventory item. And as, so, so these things are meant to be ran um, iterative, right? You run them with the CI CD pipeline or something like that. And what it does is it collects the information from VMs and it says, hey, does this match? Does this name that currently exists, does it match the UUID that it started with? If it does, then it skips it. If it doesn't, it'll actually rename the VM back to what it originally started as. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, it'll actually look at what originally, what the port group or the uh, network it's supposed to be on. And it says, hey, did this thing move? If it moves, it'll actually record some information about VLAN and things like that. It'll create a port group that has no uplinks and it'll actually move that VM 
and basically isolate it, quarantine it into a network because hey, it doesn't match what the code says. So maybe we want to find out why is this thing over there? So you can do a lot of really cool stuff. And, and, and one thing that I've seen in your, in your script is also like, you're talking about the vSphere side, but you can also be doing very important things like the SSH keys that are on the VM as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so that's that's a part that I love that it, it's it's a tool to manage everything. Absolutely. And not only can you make sure that, that the VMs are where they are supposed to be, but also the configuration in the OS. So it's absolutely it's really cool. Absolutely. So yeah, it's uh, you could do a lot of really cool stuff um, and and build out. But but I, ironically, I actually started. I actually spun up my VM host last night. Um, and started playing with some more Terraform stuff and, v and uh, Ansible on vSphere. And the whole idea was to spin up as much as possible with Terraform up front. And you always run into a scenario where, hey, it doesn't do exactly what I want. So I got on a little rant and wrote a blog post last night. So <laughs> you might want to check that out. <laughs> I'll do it. And I'll, and I'll yeah. send out that, that uh, particular URL on the VRAM uh, hashtag. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, so I won't ramble anymore, but great job, uh, Ariel. Um, anyone, by all means, um, reach out. Um, I'm always eager to talk to people, see what they're trying to do, see if I can help. Um, and always looking for new ideas and things to put together because as you showed that, that repo, that's literally, I just put stuff out there. So hopefully people get some use of it. Love it. Uh, thank you so much, Larry. And Absolutely. that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted people to see like, you know, this is a very simple example, but you can take it all the way up and it's oh, so absolutely. good. Yeah, absolutely. it's so much fun when you do. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'll also uh, open up the mic for uh, Chris Arsenal, who made a really, really good uh, B Brown bag, Ansible and CICD. Uh, Chris, I just want to get your ideas, uh, your impressions. Uh, let me see if I can find you. Where are you? There you are. So I believe I opened up your mic. You should be able to open it up. Just, just your impressions and tell me what else do you love or, or want to tell people that are just getting into Ansible. Uh, I, I like you touched on this point a good bit. I, I like the fact that uh, Camel is pretty easy to read, right? And whenever you're starting to use those modules, uh, just being able to copy and paste. But you really blew my mind. I mean, I, I made it known last week. I'm not an Ansible expert. But you blew my mind with the URI. Uh, that just opens up even more possibilities. I, I'm actually really looking forward to playing around with that. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So one another thing that I wanted to show is uh, there's people that are there, especially on, from the Red Hat side of the world, that are doing a lot of really cool series on Ansible. Uh, David Calalui, who's another person here in Pittsburgh, co-worker for Carl, started a series called Ansible for Mere Mortals, where he goes like from zero explaining Ansible as its technology itself. So that's also good because you'll need to understand some of those commands that I explained. And uh, I, I wanted to do a highlight. One of the first sessions that I saw was at a VTUB where uh, Carl Ruddy and Jonathan Prapier presented Ansibleized in vCenter with this for RESTful APIs. Now, this is a very similar session to what I show you today. And he actually goes and shout out to Kenji, who always makes this really cool, uh, <laughs> my little pony uh, graphs. But what I want to show is that he he showed, or they showed, so fully recommend you to see the whole presentation. I'm just want, trying to find where uh, he was explaining about putting uh, passwords in uh, clear text. So you that's very timely, by the way, Ariel. We did have a question about are the passwords stored ah. in text in the YAML files? Perfect, perfect. So you can tell here in this in this case that we are really putting the passwords right there in the in the code in the playbook. So if you wanted to share display with someone else, your password should be there. So he goes in and, and does a really fun fun little section. Here you go. This is where he says, uh, this is John. John puts password in playbooks. Uh, don't be like John. <laughs> so he goes in and explains how to create an Ansible vault. Uh, that vault basically stores the passwords as uh, hashed uh, values. So when you actually finally call this password, you don't call the password itself. You call the hash value. 
So I, I, somebody had told me at some point that this is really something that was uh, created by HashiCorp and that Ansible has started using. Don't quote me on that one, but you definitely want to look at Vault if you want to do this in an environment where the passwords are sensitive. Um, so yeah, this is an excellent presentation that you want to take a look and you can also reach out to uh, Jonathan and other people that you have seen here. I love their Twitter, I love the GitHubs. Um, finally, we're done. Uh, I'm hoping that this session, basically, if you had never heard of Ansible before, if you had never thought, or if you had thought that, you know, Ansible sounds like a cool thing that I should learn, but I don't have the time, you just learned it. It's super simple to start with. It's, there's lots of examples out there. Um, and again, you have a community of people that want to help you. So I'm hoping that this from zero to useful session uh, was just exactly that, that if somebody comes in tomorrow to your job and tells you, hey, I want to see if we can start using Ansible now. Do you have any idea how it works? You go like, yeah, I have a pretty good idea how it works. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to cover, but this should get you to the point that you can start copying, pasting code and testing things out in your dev environment and uh, just getting your hands dirty with it. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over back to you, Ken. Uh, if there's any questions, obviously we can open up mics. I always love uh, having interactive uh, feedback in the session itself before we stop the recording. Great stuff, Ariel, thanks. Yeah, um, I guess the biggest question would be, all these slides that you had tonight, lots of great links in them. Can people find these slides somewhere? Because I don't think they're going to be able to click furiously on the video and follow the links. <laughs> They are right here. So if you go to to blogs, um, I'm pretty sure I have them somewhere in there. But they're, so, they're, they're basically in my GitHub. So let's see. If you click in here in the Denver VMUG slide decks, it just basically takes you to my GitHub where I say VMUG talks. I've given this VMUG talk uh, for Ansible in several VMUGs now. And Pretty sure that's in Minneapolis. Yeah, so Minneapolis has exactly the Ansible and vSphere one with the example files. Awesome. Thanks, Ariel. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this. I'm seeing you know a lot of thank yous and comments. Uh, no further questions, it looks like, right now in the chat, unless somebody answer, enters one real quickly. I think we can call it a night. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Very, very cool. Thanks, Ariel. No problem, thank you.